My name is Martha Saavedra and I'm coming to you from Richmond, California. And we welcome you to our second Africa, Sports Africa Live online roundtable. We're thrilled to be able to convene this global group. Today, um, you may have, may have already heard, we are actually adding simultaneous translation into French for those who are on Zoom. So if you go to the bottom of your screen, there's a button that looks like the, uh, the world, a grid, and says interpretation. So click that and you can choose your language. I want to thank the sponsors for this event. Um, Ohio University, the folks there, um, Bose, Papa, and many others who have come from there, Simone and, and Gerard, um, have done so much to make the organization possible, but also to make these online events that we're now doing because of the global situation um, to make them possible. We also have support from the West African Resource Center, which is in Dakar, the African Studies Association, and now as soon as the checks get through the mail, the Center for African Studies at the University of California at Berkeley. Our organization, Sports Africa, is a, a scholarly organization, but it's very inclusive, so we're not just focused on, on the research, but want to talk about the, with the, the athletes and the others who are participating in sport in Africa. We are working to advance African sports studies um, and we want to be part of the global co conversation and scholarship on sport. If you do want to join our organization, um, you can uh, talk with us further. There's ways to join through the African Studies Association and we'll put that in the link in the chat right now to the African Studies Association. On this day, on this week, in this month, um, we, we are convening, of course, during the middle of a global pandemic, the COVID-19 virus. But it is also a pandemic of, of racism and police brutality and violence against uh, black people and people of color, particularly here in the United States. But we also see these tactics around the world. So we at Sports Africa, we want to state that we clearly that we stand in solidarity with the families and the communities of George Lloyd, one among too many victims of racism. There's Breonna Taylor, who just turned 27 yesterday, had she lived, Ahmaud Aubrey, and many others. In our work on sport, we specifically seek to confront the histories and the legacies of racism. We use our research and critical analysis to better understand systems of power and resistance. We want to speak truth to power. We want to raise up the voices and the lives that have previously gone unheralded. Our work, we quest after justice and we want really to contribute to a more inclusive and equitable world. And I do want to say specifically about George Lloyd. He was an athlete. He was, he played American football, but he actually, he was a basketball player. He, um, he played uh, in high school and he also played in college at South, South Florida Community College. He was a power forward, apparently a great teammate, wonderful people felt um, he was, uh, he got an athletic scholarship. He was idolized by young boys in the projects where he grew up, according to one of his friends, Eddie Barlow. Steven Jackson from the NBA was one of his really good friends and has been leading the part of the fight for justice um, for, for uh, George Floyd. So we do want to remember him as a person and as an athlete and as a basketball player. Our topic today is basketball in Africa. And through this, we want to really explore, um, last time we, we, we talked about football, Sadio Mane, Everyone is very aware of football in Africa. Um, basketball is, is also popular, but it is, is working its way into the consciousness of many across the continent. Today, we've assembled an amazing panel of people who, who have played basketball, worked on basketball, written about basketball in Africa, and continue to work to, to improve the state of basketball in Africa and across the world. So I am going to um, quickly read through people's, the, the panelists' names here. 
I will note that on the website and on the Facebook group, there are, there's more information about everybody. There are also videos that if you haven't already seen them, you can go and listen to videos um, from many of our participants where they, they talk about their experiences um, and, and, uh, and what, what it is that they are doing and can be done um, in Africa around basketball. So um, I will also uh, mention that Maktebene Amatri, who was going to be here with us, she, because of the circumstances, has decided that, uh, need, that she needs to be doing other things right now. Um, so she will not be joining us today. Um, so with joining us on this panel are Dr. Lindsay Krasnoff. She's a research associate at the Center for International Studies and Diplomacy at the School of Oriental and Indian Studies at the University of London. Um, also joining us, Joe Lopez, the president of the SEED project at the Academy um, in Senegal. Um, Joe has played in the United States and for Senegal. Um, and has been a diplomat. Um, Aniset uh, uh, Lavodrama, I don't, yes, there's Aniset Lavodrama, is based in Spain um, and uh, um, is with ACES Sport there and runs some very interesting camps. I watched some of the videos on the camps and practiced my Spanish as I was watching those. Um, uh, I'm Chef du Magaba. Um, is the founder of the Amshetu Maigaba Foundation and has also played um, basketball um, in, in, in Mali and in the United States and has specifically been focusing on Special Olympics. And I think this is another area of, of inclusivity and, and sport for all that we may want to get into. Boniface Ndong is a, a player um, also from Senegal and is a coach in Senegal, but has played in Europe and, and other places uh, around the continent, uh, around the, the globe. Um, Astu and Jai, um, she uh, played and coached in the United States um, and also for Senegal, and is now with the NBA Academy in Africa as the manager of players experience. And I can say Astu makes really good Chebujen. So <laughs> we're very, very, very much in, in uh, awe of the Chebujen, in addition to the basketball skills. Um, and then um, Isabel Yakuba, who is with the, uh, the Borg uh, Tango Borges Basket in France and has played um, a lot, uh, again, in, in many parts, uh, in Benin and in many parts of, uh, of, of Europe. So that's the introduction to the panelists. Um, for those who are listening, um, Please, um, uh, if you have questions on Zoom, put them in chat. On Facebook, put them in the comments. Um, the panelists will discuss things for a while, but uh, at the latter part of this, then we'll be bringing in comments from the participants worldwide. So I want to start first with, um, I'm going to work up from the, the bottom of the list and, and um, Isabel um, Yakubo, if you would uh, be willing to say a few words about um, maybe some of the work you're doing now and, and what you see as the challenges and the opportunities for basketball in the continent at this time. Isabel. Hi everyone, I'm so glad to be here. And as uh, a participant of this live, I think I'm the youngest. <laughs> so I don't know what I can do in front of all my big brothers and sisters. But from my experience, I started like playing basketball in Benin um, I got the opportunity, the chance to find, I call them angels in my life. They raise me and uh, make me grow up to chase and to live my dream, which was playing basketball as professional. So for me, it's still some story I cannot describe because it's still amazing for me. And the only one thing I would love to say today is we need role model for our young sisters in Africa. Um, today, when we go back in Benin, okay, they might know me in the big cities, but when you talk about Isabel Yakubu, it doesn't sound. And I am the only athlete, Olympic medal. Even if it wasn't for Benin, 
I come from there. I grew up in Benin more than France. So I think it's something we need to work on, media, um, to, to give the young one some repair. I don't know if I can say that in English. Um, something, somebody to, to look at and just being a role model. And if they have more of Isabel Yacoubou, I'm sure they will have more dreams and they can think it's possible. It's not only from James and I don't know, you know, uh, European people or American who can just come out and achieve their dreams. So first of all, for me, is the communication around what we are doing, but sincerely, I don't know how to do it. I try to make camps, to talk, and every time when I have the chance to go back in Benin, I organize things that I can talk with basketball player, but it doesn't stay, you know, during all the years, only the, the summer. So this is something I would love to improve and to make them understand that it's a lifestyle. I talk a lot, so I might. <laughs> No, thank you. That's wonderful. And, and, and I also should have mentioned that um, you mentioned, uh, um, uh, well, so many of the people on the call right here um, on the panel are champions of various sorts of winning medals and things like that. And so definitely um, we want to celebrate the, these, these accomplishments and, um, uh, and, and that you are role models. So um, I'm going to turn it to Astu and Jai, um, and maybe you could talk a bit about um, what you're doing and, and how you see the future of basketball um, in, on the continent. Uh, your sound is not coming through yet, I think. So, Astu, we'll work with you again. Um, so, Boniface and Dong, so maybe you could also speak now about, uh, about your work. Hi, uh, thank you first for in the invitation and hi to everybody. I won't go by name because I know so many people in this panel and people that are doing great things, you know, for Africa and all around the world. Uh, I'm actually coaching right now in the United States, uh, in Denver, and uh, I've been named uh, this year uh, the national team of the men's uh, national team in Senegal. So I'm going to start... Uh, I mean, it's supposed to start this summer, but you know, with the situation of the COVID, uh, I'll be starting next summer. So looking forward, uh, uh, you know, to bring some changes in my country and just try to do things better. You know, I know we're going to talk about all the things in Africa, but what Africa needs today is, you know, role models, of course, but uh, uh, people who have the knowledge that has the experience around the world to come back and help, you know, because we are the only one, you know, that can make the difference, you know. There are people that are willing to help us, but we have to do our part, you know, and uh, like I said, you know, a lot of people in this panel that I know are doing great things, so please keep it up. All right. Um, I'm Shetu Maiga Ba. Maybe we could turn to you right now and... and um... Yeah. Yeah. Hello again, everybody. And uh, I would say to the and all the... Uh, members of the Africa Life, Africa Sports Network, thank you for having us. It's uh, definitely an honor to be among everyone here. Uh, personally, I do through my uh, own foundation, but um, we worked for, uh, to push basketball, but using basketball as a pathway to education. We want the kids to put a focus because for the most part, 90% of our athletes tend to just give up their studies to focus on sports. And once they finish, they have nothing after. So that's a big focus that we have been modeling SEED, try to model SEED's uh, concept, how, they've, how much impact they've had in Senegal. And through my own experience in US, I figured that it's definitely something that Mali also should have, a platform to help the kids focus on their, not only again, uh, basketball, but uh, their studies not having to give up one for the other. And Special Olympic is a passion of mine for having seen in US and going back again to my country, seeing that it doesn't exist. Those at least are all, the, all those people with intellectual disabilities are left on their own. So that's an area also that I wanted to have an impact on. And with you know, a lot of people that I work with, of course, 
we decided to add that as part of our mission, which is using basketball as a pathway for education, but also inclusion for all. So through the camps, we go back and do camps. And some of the things that we focus on is only, I used to do camps just for those with intellectual disability on the side and normal people. So now the focus is to have the camp for all, everybody at the same time. So it was very impactful because the kids, a lot of them have no idea of those people with intellectual disabilities. They got to see them and see that they are just like us. So for that, I'm thankful to have had that uh, platform and to impact those other kids and to see that those with intellectual disabilities shouldn't be left on the side. As for the uh, impact on what can be done in Africa, as follow on what uh, both Boniface and uh, uh, Isabel said, the whole model part is definitely huge. And it's not that we don't have it. We have a bunch of them. It's just unfortunate, like Isabel said, it's not uh, mediatized. It's not been, it's not shown as much as possible. So that media part, like she said, when we go back, we do as much as possible. But unfortunately, given that currently we're not in the continent, what we do, the sustainability is not there 100%. So those are some things that I think is huge. And another area that I think will be impactful with infrastructure part. For soccer, anybody can play soccer anywhere. You just take two rocks, you put it in their play. Whereas for basketball, we need to have the different, um, the infrastructure to be there. Inside, some of them we have outside courts, maybe nice if we have more uh, uh, um, stadiums or uh, gymnasiums for continued practice and stuff. So I would let that uh, end. <laughs> I know infrastructure came up in a lot of the, the pre-recorded uh, pre um, uh, conversations that were had. Let's um, return to Astu um, and Jai now. I'm really um, privileged to be part of this panel, saying hello to everyone that's on there and listening. Um, I am in Senegal. Uh, after having had a stint of 20 plus years in the U.S., uh, chasing my dream, right, like many of us, and uh, returned about four years ago to um, be home, because there's a lot to do at home, but uh, this happened through an organization that's been in existence for 20 years, Seed Project. You can check it out at seedproject.org. That works in partnership since 2016, officially with the NBA. Um, I work with boys most of the days and do partly advisement at Seed Project. And uh, also on my own, I do in partnership also with Seed Girls, uh, girls Outreach. Because um, we do know that uh, most opportunities are going to boys uh, in most part of the world. So just uh, trying to do my part in uh, serving and sharing my experience at home and across the continent and also um, as I'm sure too and my other um, compadres talked about spreading our experience because um, we need more of us to be out there and I right now we're doing that through the Sports Africa that's based in the US and a company like uh, SOS, SOAS that did um, this initiative not long ago to be able to track who's been in the game and who's doing what uh, in the game and around the game. I think as I'm sure too said, we need that to happen in the continent so that all these hidden role models can be put in front of the kids. To me, is uh, a huge need for, uh, for our youth because uh, there's nothing like knowing yourself, where you're from and what have driven the people that were before you. There's a lot of personality in this panel and growing up, we didn't know some of them. Somebody like Mr. Joe Lopez, who was the first Senegalese to uh, pave the path going to the U.S. I didn't know that. I knew that when I came back and grown up and got to learn more about the game. So our identity is huge. I'm just going to stop there because I know there's a lot to come, but I'm uh, privileged to be uh, part of the panel. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Anissa de la um, could you uh, join us now um, and, and tell us about where you are, what you're doing, and, and the opportunities and challenges that you see for African basketball? Okay, well, uh, thank you, Marta. Very uh, nice meeting you. Uh, and uh, thank you to uh, 
for Africa Live for this opportunity to be able to discuss and uh, share our views and our experience with so many uh, uh, great people. You know, uh, uh, some of them are uh, friends of mine. And uh, I take on uh, what Boniface and uh, Isabel have said in terms of uh, uh, role models that we need, especially in this time where, uh, because of the recent uh, death of uh, George Floyd, we are all uh, around the world motivated and um, uh, called upon to, uh, to react, you know, as a whole against, of course, uh, hatred, violence, and uh, uh, ignorance, basically, you know, what is resumed into uh, racism. You know, and we are all basically uh, uh, able to voice our, our opinion and uh, uh, our sentiments against something that is uh, that shouldn't be happening you know nowadays in in the year two, 2020 i'm from the uh, central african republic and uh, because of uh, certain circumstances you know of my my father's work i was able to live in different countries in uh, uh, in africa such as the drc congo or the Ivory coast which is where i started playing basketball and then after graduating from high school, I went to, uh, to the US to uh, college. Uh, I went to uh, Houston Baptist University and uh, then I moved on to basketball. My dream was not really uh, uh, making it into basketball as a professional. My dream as taught by uh, both my mom and my dad uh, was to become someone and becoming someone usually in, in Africa, as most of you know, is to get a diploma, you know, to get very well trained, get a university uh, uh, education, and then you're gonna start working within your field. In my case, you know, I took on uh, getting a, a, a double major degree in, um, in uh, finance and management, but then I got into basketball and that gave me a chance to, uh, to, uh, to know something that uh, Madiba Mandela, you know, uh, Raman Hidalgo, but then, he mentioned the uh, strength and the power of uh, sport and uh, how sport is able to unite and uh, most societies. And, and uh, in many African countries, you, uh, you are able to know of those countries, even though the small countries, they're always going to be in the podium in, let's say, track and field, for example. If it's Ethiopia, Kenya, you would hear positive things about those countries because of sports. And to me, that's, uh, that's, uh, that's very important. And that, call, that calls on uh, all of us as uh, people who are known uh, in our countries, in my case, in the Central African Republic, and here in Spain, because of uh, our, our sports achievement, uh, call upon to be leaders somehow, you know, to be leaders to what we do, to what we say, to how we are able to, uh, uh, let's say, just inspire and motivate the, the, the younger generation. And to me, that's, uh, like I say, it's an honor to be part of this panel and hopefully we're gonna be able to contribute what I do uh, now uh, through my work with my, um, uh, my company called ACI Sport is to train people, train, train people in terms of the technical aspect of basketball, but mainly to focus on how you are able to uh, combine uh, positively, being able to go to school, not sacrifice school because you want to pursue your dream in uh, in sport. You know, so we, this is this is the focus of everything I do. Every chance every chance I get is to remind everyone, families, you know, the younger ones that you are able to also pursue your uh, own training as a person, as a human being at school. At the same time as you try to pursue what you see in the media, which are your heroes in, uh, in sports. It's a responsibility and uh, thank you again for uh, having me on the panel. Hey, thank you so much. Um, and we're going to move to Joe Lopez right now. And I think everybody's done it, but once, if you're not talking anymore, mute yourself and that will help with the audio. Um, so Joe Lopez, um, tell us about what you're doing and what you see as the opportunities and challenges. Well, first of all, uh, thank you for the opportunity to share my experience with you. Uh, also, uh, I'd like to welcome all the viewers around the world who are listening. Uh, this is a very important topic. Hey, Martha, I do appreciate you bringing George Lloyd because uh, it is a problem that's pandemic around the world, especially in the United States. 
having lived for 40 years in the United States, I can attest to that. So I do appreciate that. I'm not going to get into the details because I think uh, you've done a good job talking about that. But I've, I came back to Senegal about um, three years ago, after close to 40 years living in the United States. Uh, I am all today involved with, with the SEED project, SEED Academy, that was founded 20, 20, uh, 22 years by Amadou Dalofal, who works for the NBA today. Uh, and uh, it is a grassroots program where we are empowering young boys and girls to become the future leader of Africa. And since I've been president, I've been putting a lot of emphasis on education because education is something that cannot be taken away from you. Basketball, you can get hurt, blow a knee, <laughs> tear an ankle, and your career goes out, I mean, down, this, down the drain. But your education is something that cannot and will not be taken away from you. So that's what um, uh, we we're pushing for today. We have, uh, the SEED project has really helped a lot of kids on this continent. I mean, in the thousands. And I'm not gonna name them because we do have some very illustrious alumni who played in the NBA today, and you probably know who they are. But our focus is the kids we have now because they are the future leader of Africa. They are the future doctors, engineers, and president of this great continent. And it's about time that um, we start focusing within ourselves because too many times we're thinking about outside help coming to help us. But today we have a platform on this continent to do great things. And I believe the COVID-19 has taught us that we are all human, uh, you know, and I call it the equalizer. So today Africans need to understand one thing very clear. We need to take our destiny in our own hands and at seed we start with our kids. I will stop here because I know we have a lot of topics to talk about. And, um, but before I uh, stop, I like to, like I always do, uh, we talk about all the, the illustrious members of this panel, the great basketball players that these gentlemen and these, and these ladies are, but before them, they were great, they were great ones too. And I would like to salute all of them. I'm not gonna mention them by name. Some of them were my peer or my, are my peers and some of them older than I. And I like to say, Thank you for paving the way for us. Thank you, Joe. With that, let's go to um, Lindsay Krasnoff. Um. Hi, um, I, I'd like to echo everyone in my thanks to the organizers and our hosts uh, for today and for the ability to let us engage in this important conversation. Uh, so I come to the topic of African basketball a little bit differently as a scholar practitioner. Uh, my work um, as an affiliated researcher with SOAS is uh, more on the sports diplomacy side. And we've recently completed a project on basketball diplomacy in Africa, which, has, which is through the lens um, that I really come to this topic. Um, what is sports diplomacy, whether it's basketball diplomacy or otherwise, it's the intersection of the sports world with the diplomatic one, um, effectively the communication, representation, and negotiation that occurs in and around the sports terrain. Um, and you know, certainly with the evolution of internet and social media, as well as the evolution of um, public diplomacy in general, uh, the concept of who conducts sports diplomacy has, is changing. Um, and uh, the identities of sports person uh, and diplomat are not necessarily separate ones. Um, so it's through this lens of sports diplomacy that I have been um, learning much more about African basketball and the lack of relative lack of scholarly work on the topic in general, African basketball, its history and otherwise. Um, leaves me with a lot more questions than answers necessarily, but you know, the, the, the main thing I'm trying to do is to help to shed light on a lot of the good work that has been going on and um, thinking a little bit more forward in the future. In terms of the Basketball Diplomacy Africa project, some of the things uh, I'll just kind of 
make one or two um, short observations. Uh, and I'm sure that a lot more will be drawn out throughout our conversation. But the one thing that struck me um, based on the interviews with uh, different participants um, who we conducted, um, the thing that stands out is that basketball is very much seen as an education and an educational endeavor. And uh, several of you have already touched on that component very much. And I think that allows a lot of flexibility and a, a lot of um, future opportunities uh, for basketball, not just in its growth and development, but also as a tool for education and other, other endeavors, um, much more so than say football, which is perhaps much more popular and popularly played and needed to size and um, consumed. Uh, and it, that, that was something that struck me with the um, previous panel on um, Mane, Sidio Mane, and you know, the, the emphasis on economic endeavors in sports versus the educational endeavors. Um, so basketball is an educational tool endeavor. That's one of the things that has really um, jumped out at me as well as how that feeds into the conversation about basketball uh, providing opportunities for women and girls and kind of through, through that nexus. It also touches on the issue of migration, which I know is something um, under consideration. Uh, the other thing that I would just put out there is in the course of my conversations um, on compiling the oral histories for this project, I was really struck by the fact that basketball, while it is an old, relatively old sport invented over 125 years ago in the United States, it has grown um, to be seen as a global sport. And it, there, it just feels like it's a very cutting edge forward, forward looking sport, um, particularly uh, in different parts of Africa. And so that's why I say it seems like there's a lot of good opportunities there, um, at least according to those who I've spoken with. So I will stop there and uh, edit myself out at three minutes. Okay, great. Um, so I, I'm going to start with a, uh, a, a general question that kind of brings in two pieces of this, um, things that people have already mentioned that um, could potentially be intention, intention, particularly with limited resources. And it seems like so many of you are, are really focusing on education, on working with um, young people, future leaders, um, integrating those with intellectual disabilities, with, um, with others, other kids, and, and really working at, um, in French, le bas, you know, at, at that level. And, and it's important to spread that and, and support that. Um, but I also know that there's been work um, uh, more at the elite level within the continent to develop like the NBA has the African Basketball League. And in Senegal, I, I worked on some research there many years ago, um, looking at the, the different kinds of play that was happening on teams that were national teams. And, and so the attempt, so um, again, I, I'm curious about uh, what you see as the tension of, you know, become a role model, there has to be success and notoriety at the elite level, but that can also often be intention in terms of resources and um, maybe what a federation is doing or what FIBA is doing. Um, how, how do you balance that with continuing to develop the base? So I'm curious, um, and, and uh, I know there's several of you, I'm not quite sure. If you have something to say, maybe raise your hand and, and we'll go through and um, if, if you have something to say. Okay, Joe, go ahead. Uh, I'm so glad you brought this topic. Uh, when you focus on to the elite, it's, it's not gonna be sustainable. So you gotta start at a grassroots level. You gotta develop kids from a very young age in order to be able to to sustain an elite program. And that's something that we understood as um, a seed. And we are going around reinventing the wheel, but you know, I'm a product of that environment where um, many decades ago, we were identified as a group of young men, 14, 15 year old ki uh, kid from Senegal. And we became the backbone of, of the national team of Senegal. And most of us won African championship under the age of 20 through training and dedication. And it kept going for a long time. 
and why Senegal, and I'm going to bring this up, why Senegal uh, lost some of the championship is because of the federation kind of stepped away from what worked. Because if we had maintained what was working, we would have had players who were playing in France, come back in Senegal and play with some of the elite kids and still be able to maintain that level of, of performance. But because of the, the ineptitude of some of the folks who were at the head of the, of the federation, uh, you know, things kind of fell aside. And then that's when Angola came and became a dominant factor in Africa. But not because they had better talent, it's because they understood how things were to be developed at the grassroots level. So I just wanted to bring that point out. Great, thank you. Um, um, Anisette and then Boniface. Oh, you turn, um, unmute yourself. I, um, I wanted to uh, pick up on uh, what Joe just uh, stated um, in regard the works, the work that needs to be done within each country. Uh, one of the key uh, elements, in fact, I always want to want to uh, uh, to keep on the table is, in the last 50 years, uh, there have been over 65 coups who have, who that has transitioned, you know, the uh, administration and political uh, 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 landscape in most of the countries. So many of the African countries, you know, 65, 67 uh, coup, this is, this is a lot. Uh, therefore, most of the families, most of the countries, most of the different institutions in those countries do not have the chance to work over the long term, do not have the chance to plan and say, we're going to start planting some seed, as in the uh, academy, and look forward to collect uh, the fruit over 5, 10, 15, 20 years, which is, which is key for any structure, for any country or for any continent to, uh, uh, to think about developing, to think about growing, to think about offering just better, uh, better circumstances to, uh, to their population. So since most of the African countries do not have that stability and you're not able to work, even if you work in your own company, or in the uh, sports federation, you do not have the guarantee that you're going to be uh, acting again or uh, operating, let's say uh, two years from now or even uh, a year from now. There may be something political, something military, something social happening that's gonna just um, endanger everything that anyone would have planted to try and develop any structure. Some kids sometimes uh, stop going to school for like three months, five months, even a full year, you know, the, you, you see a lot of what they call in uh, French, uh, the uh, année blanche, where no one goes to school because of uh, political uh, unrest or military actions. And uh, the country just stopped working as we are now basically uh, uh, three months into a global uh, stoppage because of the COVID-19. So to me, for things to develop in Africa, for the kids to be able to go to school and learn their trade, learn uh, any, anything that's going to make them become, uh, uh, as Joe mentioned, you know, you're a doctor, of course, uh, a lawyer, uh, you're a carpenter or, uh, or a pharmacist, etc. You need to have stability in those countries. You need to have stability of structure. And then you need to see that there's going to be guarantees of uh, legal uh, uh, legal protection, judicial protection, uh, protection, so that the countries offer a guarantee to any family, to anyone who wants to invest in Africa, or invest in their own country, that something is going to be done over the long run. No results is going to come after one year or just one week of work. It's going to take, it's going to take a little while. So it is key uh, when we all have a chance to speak to a global panel, to a global audience to, re to remind this because we need for each of the countries, each of the institutions and the uh, political administration in all of the countries in Africa to be able to guarantee a transition of power, transition and evolution in how countries are administered and, uh, and managed. Uh, this is gonna allow things such as uh, uh, a sport, for example, and education 
to evolve properly and we're going to have better trained people. We're going to get more investment locally and then uh, uh, investment from, uh, from outside. The key thing is for our countries to be stable and uh, no one should have any doubt that if I invest in country X or country Y, my investment is going to be protected, is going to be guaranteed, and there's going to be return. Either creating uh, employment locally and then giving a platform for, in the case of uh, sport, to be able to develop in hopefully uh, uh, an evolving and, uh, and ascending uh, uh, manner. Thank you. Um, Boniface and then Isabel. Yes. And so, then Astrid. Thank you, Joe, and thank you, Anisette. I think uh, what you said, it's, uh, it's so true and so important. Uh, but I think in Africa, we have to, to see sport as a tool of development, right? Because everything we're talking about in Africa is, you know, the continent need to develop, people are trying to help us to develop. But we need to see that today, uh, sport is a real tool of development, okay? Sayo Mane is doing great things in Senegal. He's only one person. Uh, Gorgi CJ is doing great things in Senegal. So I'm going to put together what you guys said between Joy and, and, and uh, Anisette. We have to help our big talents because in Africa, we have a lot of talents to reach their goal. If I talk about basketball, for example, what Sid is doing, it'll give the most chances possible to many Africans to be able to come to the States, you know, first to have a degree, study, but to have an opportunity to, to be a basketball player. Why? Because we have talents and we will have a lot more. I can talk about Joel Embiid, I can talk about Siakam. These single people can do big difference. I don't talk about only sport, but economically, you know, through their foundation, through the work they do. But to make those things happen, we have to multiply the chances, like Joe said, having maybe more seeds. And this is where we have to make our government understand that investing in sport is that's going to accelerate the development of Africa. I can talk about Anisette, right? In Spain, every municipality, doesn't matter how small it is, have infrastructure, has a football pitch, have a basketball court, an indoor basketball court, and have a swimming pool. So talking about basketball, until we have indoor, like Amsha to said, Indoor basketball court, we cannot develop our players. So we, as people who made it, and we made it, you can say, Anisette can say, we had to go abroad to make it. If you make those infrastructure happen in our country that we cannot all do, in my little town, Point Saren, we have a basketball court because I did it. But I wish I could do an indoor court because it's very expensive. This is where we have to try to convince our government that if you invest today in infrastructure, Tomorrow you will have 100 Sayomane, 100 Gorgi uh, Sijen uh, that are gonna come and even invest more than what you put in, a, in, a, in the infrastructure. And this is maybe what is missing in Africa, that our government doesn't see sport as business. So let's help them understand that. Let's show them, do our part, like what CD is doing should have been done long time. What the NBA Academy did in Senegal should have been done long time. Because I say, it's not that we don't have the money. Maybe we think it's not a priority, and I think it's a real priority because it might bring maybe development faster than all the things that we are investing into. Okay, thank you. Um, Isabel. Oh, he just stole my words. For me, we can uh, really, we can talk about money, economic side, political, but I think the priority is to make understand people, even uh, the young ones, that they can make the job Sport can be their job. And when I started, it was the first thing my parents asked me, you want to play basketball, but you're sturdy? What are you going to leave from after, you know? And this is the main question. Like, being a professional, it's a work. And if everybody understands that, I think the, the government will put it as a priority because we all want our kids to do what they love, right? And to find the job that, they do with love and they get, you know, accomplishment. So I think this is really the priority. When people will start to believe that sport is um, a work, they will, of course, do the things to make it easier around. Because for them now, it's just like a hobby. Oh, we have other priorities. But, and I come back to the fact that showing role model, look, this guy make it, this one make it. And we, if we showed a lot like this, they might say, oh, 
it's an investment, but after it comes back, as Boniface said, if we all become, you know, big and, you know, stars and even leaders in our own range, we can come back and help the others. And it won't be only one people doing one court, but maybe 10 or 100 doing, you know, event and helping development. That's what I just wanted to add. Okay, us too. Thank you, Isabel. Well, I'm glad we're all thinking along the same line. This is, uh, I'm glad we really are because Boniface and, um, and Isabel hit it on the spot that best practices need to be spread. And not just like, because the, the elite is few, right? There's a few up there, but everything else, the whole ecosystem that revolves around sports, if it become a priority among the priorities of government. And um, my, my other thing that really I, that I take to heart is how our government don't realize that when our kids start sports early, in 20 years, the workforce will be healthy and can last longer. That baffles me and have always made me feel like, am I not thinking this right? It's to me, it's just one plus one that haven't added up for so long. And all of us thinking along the same line and being where we are in some way, shape or form can impact this, amplify it and do what we can. But we need more, basically. Thank you. Okay. Um. I'm too. Yes, go ahead. I uh, would like to follow up on um, everything that's been said so far. To me, there has to be a happy medium in the sense that, yes, as you mentioned, um, Martha, in the beginning, that now they're switching uh, the focus into uh, elite. And Joe is mentioning that there has to be a focus at the grassroots. I totally agree, grassroots is important, and that's how we get farther. But at the same time, having the elite is a huge plus for Africa that we didn't have. And as Boniface is saying, the fact that, okay, all those athletes, if they go, we have to go up way to be big athletes that we are today, to be as successful that we're able to be. And if we have that in Africa, we're gonna have many also in Africa. Because what we see nowadays is that many of our athletes, those that, the many that have left Africa to go US or Europe, if you don't make it to the NBA or the WNBA or those that go to Europe don't make it far, 90% of them, their careers are finished. So to me, having that platform back in Africa is huge. Huge for Africa basketball in general. The fact that those athletes, once they don't make it to those high levels, they still can back to their countries, compete at a very high level and be still productive. And I still want to say add the fact that, yes, there is a business part on that and the government uh, giving that all the instability sometimes in Africa, it's hard to have good investors wanting to come back and invest their money in Africa. That part is definitely unfortunate. Hopefully our politics will get in line and be as, uh, how you say, it's, uh, not successful, but impactful as they need to be. And in that sense that we have that, that part cover, the business part cover, but I don't want us to forget the education part because not everybody is gonna be great at this. So those that are there, if we have a focus on the business and also have finding the happy medium and starting, for instance, at a young level in the school stuff. I remember in my country, when I was young, we used to play um, what we call enter schools. We compete against each other. It was a pride stuff. And those are gone. And I see NBA and junior NBA in some countries doing that. And I take Gabon, for instance, that have started doing the back to the uh, school competitions. Because those stuff gives those kids something to fall back on. Like as to say, it makes them healthy, if nothing else. Not, it keeps them healthy and away from a lot of distractions. So why are we running away from that, not putting a huge focus on the education part? And at the end of the day, even if they don't make it far, they had something, they were athletes a little bit, and they can focus on their schoolwork. So I would like for us to find a happy medium between the educational part and the business. The business is important because at the end of the day, like soccer has become, basketball can, basketball can be the same stuff, can bring the same infrastructure. Um, uh, 
benefit for athletes. And infrastructure to me is key on that. If every team or every country, the focus is like the teams, they cannot be um, uh, rich or how you say, like they don't have the revenues because all the games are played in one stadium. How is the revenue shared? You know, so based on that, the teams don't have the, um, the means to make their players, pay their players the way they should. So if every team is able to build this, uh, a, um, a stadium or a, how you call it, inside gym, so that they can control how the revenue share, they can sell jerseys, all the stuff that we see in the in US or Europe from being, those are stuff that we can implement back home. But unfortunately, the structure and the infrastructures are lacking. So um, that's... I just had another con comment. I don't know, Lindsay, did you also have something? So, um, I just okay. wanted to add that the Basketball Africa League is going to be starting to be just what um, Auntie is saying because it's time and we all know it's past due, but I think uh, it will bring out the best of what Africa has to offer. Just need to point that out. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Anisette? I wanted to uh, to insist on uh, all those great comments that everyone has made uh, that Anchetu just mentioned and also uh, uh, Astu just underlined. Sports is going to happen and sports happen within uh, an economic and political and social situation. So the uh, African League that have been uh, promoted and hopefully we're going to start seeing it soon uh needs to be guaranteed that if i am a team uh in uh, let's say uh, uh, uh senegal and i have to travel to cameroon or to any other countries in africa you as a as a team person are the manager coaches players you would like to be sure and be guaranteed that if you travel to that country though you will not be uh, flying into any sort of uh, military or war situation. I mean, to me, for our countries to be able to be as, let's say, well-structured as Senegal is, you know, I, I've always been very, uh, uh, you know, a fan of, uh, of Senegal because the political transition in Senegal has been, so to speak, exemplary, you know, which is not the case in most of the other African countries. So in Senegal, you're able to develop Maybe it doesn't go as fast as we would like it to be, but it's much better than in many countries, such as my country, for example, where every two, three, four years, you know there's going to be a military conflict, a political conflict. So it's very important for the African global community and the international global community is able to uh, make it so that you will get more stability, more continuity in most of the uh, African countries so that you can really plan education, you can really plan uh, uh, investment potential, you can really plan a way for people to build their life and, uh, and for the country to grow. The country is gonna grow if you get better educated, better trained people, and then the economy is going to be solid enough so that through that uh, guarantee, uh, there is a question here about Gerard, for example, where they're asking about the legislations. In many of those countries, it's all very insecure. There is basically no legal guarantee that anything you do is going to be protected. Let's say owning a piece of land, if you want to build a facility, an indoor, an indoor gym, which is what would be the ideal thing, it's always very difficult to know if you build that facility you're going to really have proper ownership or in five years, for example, that gym is going to stand again. This is not the case in many of our countries, unfortunately. But to me, training people, education is key. As I said uh, before, when I went to the US, nowadays most people go because they want to get a chance to play, uh, to play the sport, to play basketball. But in my time, I went to the US because my dad and my mother uh, focused on me getting an education, okay, which was my primary focus. And then I had the talent, which is what people slowly started telling me that I had the talent to play sport. You know, I was not really aware. I like sport, but my thing was to get my degree, to get a diploma. 
And to me, that's like every, that's every time I get a chance to speak to young people, this is what I convey to them. But of course, you also have to convey to them to be ambitious enough to try and become professional uh, uh, athletes, professional basketball players, and then afterwards do as many people have done, and I know Boniface has done so, and um, Chetu or Astu, you go back locally and you are able to invest and do your little part, building a gym, organizing your camp, uh, you know, providing little scholarship to certain kids, you know, boys and girls for them to uh, continue studying. And I know that with sports, we, we are able to do that. But our countries, our nations, needs to be stable and needs to be well, well, well uh, managed. Um, Joe, go ahead. Quickly, I just want to give you some stats that are quite important because we talked about professional athletes. Those are a very small, if I may use them, very small minority. The NBA today has 450 active players out of thousands of college uh, kids who play basketball, and how many basketball players in France, all over the world, who wants to play in the NBA. So the chance of getting into the NBA is really the luck of a draw. Today you have 205 kids who have, who have declared themselves eligible for the draft, and out of that, maybe 60 will be taken. What will happen to the rest? And these are from all over the world. So just to put things in perspective, in what Anisette Lavradroma said, for me, I'm going to die on my sword. Education is a key because I've, I've known a lot of tremendous basketball players who never saw an NBA basketball floor. Right? So today, uh, to what my colleagues on the panel said, yes, um, the, the leadership of this continent need to value sports because with the BAL, for instance, which is a professional league, there is something else that the BA will bring is the ecosystem around sports. And, and those people will not be basketball players, they'll be engineers, doctors, gardeners, uh, ground keepers. And that's what we need to focus on today on how to develop the continent as a whole. And I think everybody touched on that. I just, I just want to bring the stats to just let some of the audience or, or maybe the viewers know that to get into the professional elite NBA, it's the very, very best of the best that gets in. Um, maybe building off of that, um, uh, relative to football, there's there's more, just there's more players on the field in in football and soccer. Um, it, but also, as as some of you mentioned earlier, the infrastructure requires at least out uh, outdoor hard courts and then indoor courts. And um, some people have considered that basketball may be a luxury sport. And um, so I'm curious if you think that relative to other sports, um, is basketball a luxury for Africa? And maybe um, somebody pointed out the Angola model where businesses have to invest in, in sport teams and you see this in other parts. Maybe it's a difference between the, you know, the francophone version of sport versus other, um, either the lusophone or anglophone versions, I don't know. But is there, um, is basketball a luxury sport? Um, and, you know, it, is there some way that, uh, it, it, by the nature of it, that it, it is, it's harder to, to get to the grassroots and to spread it um, on the African continent? Okay, I guess the question is directed at me, maybe. Or any, so everybody, think, but you can start, Joe. I'll, I'll take a stab at that. I think um, basketball is not a luxury sport, but to compete at a certain level, you got to garner sponsorship. Sponsorship is very important in, in any kind of sport, and basketball is not excluded out of that. If you take, for instance, in Senegal, you have all these team clubs and no sponsorship. I mean, they struggle to survive, right? And hopefully with the BAL in place, it, you know, some new techniques will be put in place that will allow people to be more focused on, on sponsorship. Because to develop any kind of sport, like Boniface was saying it, you know, in Spain, if the municipality is not behind it, there is somebody, some donor, some sponsor that will be able to address some of the economic need to be able to play sports of any sports, right? So sponsorship to me is key. 
to developing a, a part of um, the um, you know the basketball program you know that we're talking about today. You got to have uh, sponsors involved, and to get sponsors, you have to go and get them. You have to, you have to go and look for them and bring them into uh, the mix of things to get uh, the sports developed at every level, you know, from the grassroots on to the elite level. Okay. Um, I have. I have uh... I have a comment to uh, to add on to what Joe is uh, is saying. I had the opportunity and the honor to work at FIBA uh, after I retired as a player, and then uh, with FIBA together with the partnership uh, uh, with the NBA, we started the first basketball without border program in a key country for Africa uh, culturally and socially, uh, which is uh, South Africa. And uh, that made the NBA to bring the uh, professional management of the sport uh, model together with the global uh, governing of uh, the sport that FIBA does, uh, which made it, uh, made it a platform where to many countries in Africa, the model of uh, uh, the uh, Basketball Without Border is to identify five, ten, uh, of the best players identified locally by the federation to be brought to one place in uh, in South Africa when we started doing it. And then during those uh, basketball be without border camps, you are able to do grassroots program with those young kids from all those different countries in Africa, seeing what was able to be accomplished, building an orphanage, uh, renewing uh, the uh, school infrastructure, uh, basically donating through most of the contribution by many of the uh, uh, NBA players, donating equipment, material, uh, 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 funds to build different facilities. And that was key for people to see that through sponsorship, through partnership, many things could be achieved to renew hospitals, schools, build the library, build a youth, a youth program, uh, assist in uh, building infrastructure, and then at the same time, train young kids in the sport. And to answer your question, Martha, whether uh, basketball is a luxury, basketball is a luxury because, uh, not as such, but it's a luxury because you need the facilities. You need people to uh, go beyond playing, as I did in my younger age, to play outside when it's 40 degree uh, uh, outside, but we kept on practicing. And then you could not play beyond, let's say, 6 p.m. because there was no lights, okay? Nowadays, you need for not only the Basketball Federation, but the Sports Ministry, the National Olympic Committee, the government to invest in that because eventually this is going to create a business. It's going to create an economy. You're going to have maybe indoor facilities where the Federation or the clubs are going to be able to get some uh, ticket incomes or you're gonna be able to offer a platform for the different companies in the country or in the city to invest in sponsorship uh, uh, mechanism if you have an indoor facility, because you're gonna say, I am such and such a car dealership or restaurant or a, a phone company. I'm gonna do my uh, uh, publicity in that gym. People are gonna be able to see it and I'm able to catch and hopefully uh, bring clients to my business. But for this to be done, you need the legal framework to be protected. You need the countries to be stable so that in those countries, you're going to have beyond the main city to the other cities, you're going to have economic structures that are gonna be able to finance and assist in the development of the sport. A luxury sport, not really. It costs money, yes, but the country needs to be able to produce the economy to be able to build that infrastructure, to offer equipment and um, uh, shoes, balls, uniform to most of the most of those uh, practicing the sport. Uh, Boniface, you had a comment, and then Isabel. Yes, yes I will repeat uh, what you guys said. I think it's completely true, but one point I'm going to add is uh, mismanagement. Okay, because we know that this might be the biggest problem in Africa. So we can talk about sponsorship, we can talk about uh, building, you know, facilities, but in Africa, we don't know to manage funds. And, and really what hurts me is, look at this panel. We're mostly living abroad. 
we are very good at what we do when we are not in our countries. So why when we are in our countries, we don't do the things right? Because we adapt or we refuse to fight. So I think for Africa to develop, we need to learn to manage because sponsors are not going to give you money if you are not clean, you know, in, in your account. So, and, and they will start with education and values and culture. So everything is good. People can help us. We can do things. But until we are faithful to ourselves, we are openly clean because we are good. We showed we are good. If Amadou Fall today is leading the NBA in Africa because he's good, but why can he not lead in Senegal? Why we don't let our good people come back and lead? So this is really, we have to turn the fight off to be clean, corruption, mismanagement, and all those things. Thank you. Um, Isabel? Um, for this, I would love to go French because I need to speak up right what I think. Um, par rapport à, um, au fait que le basketball soit un sport de luxe, je pense que c'est le cas. Um, J'ai joué sur les terrains là-bas et je peux vous assurer qu'il n'y a pas sur ce terrain de playground euh, où on ne trouve pas un enfant ou sans chaussures ou avec des chaussures trouées et, et qui n'avait pas les moyens de s'acheter une paire de chaussures. Si on ne peut pas s'acheter une paire de chaussures, comment veut-on jouer au basket aujourd'hui Sachant que la plupart des terrains qu'on a sont en ciment. C'est des terrains qui sont construits juste avec du béton. Et, et pour moi, évidemment que c'est un sport de luxe. Moi, j'ai eu la chance d'avoir des parents qui m'équipaient mais ce n'est pas le cas aujourd'hui et depuis 2000, euh, 2015, je rentre au Bénin, je fais des camps, mais ce n'est pas seulement je rentre pour faire des camps, je ramasse, je collecte toute l'année ici des chaussures pour pouvoir distribuer. Et je sais que les enfants, il ben, n'y en a jamais assez pour tout le monde, mais ils attendent ça avec impatience, pouvoir repartir avec une paire qu'ils espèrent pouvoir le faire durer pendant une année. Donc, à, au moment où on arrive à, à se poser des questions sur le simple fait, je ne parle pas de vêtements, de sacs, de d'accessoires extraordinaires, juste de basket pour pouvoir jouer. Et pour moi, oui, c'est un sport qui est complètement élitiste aujourd'hui pour l'Afrique. Euh, quels parents aujourd'hui mettraient, alors qu'ils ont besoin d'argent pour manger, mettraient 10 000 francs CFA qui représentent peut-être la popote pour le mois entier pour acheter des paires de baskets, des Jordan, des Nike, des Adidas enfin, Pour moi, en tout cas, je ne suis pas d'accord avec les panélistes. C'est vraiment un sport de luxe. Tant que euh, cette prise en charge ne sera pas faite, et aujourd'hui, encore une fois, il faut voir le, pa le panier moyen de chaque foyer, parce qu'on demande à tous les enfants de pratiquer du basket, il ne faut pas se voir en tant que privilégié et des familles où on vient, où on n'a pas eu de soucis, mais il faut voir l'Africain moyen, évidemment que ça a un coût d'équiper son enfant pour, euh, pour pratiquer le basket. Okay. Um, could I ask somebody to do a quick translation? I caught some of that, but I could not translate it quickly. So I don't know, Amos, I don't know if you can pick that up or um, to just summarize what uh, Isabel just said. said um, or asked to, go ahead. <laughs> I will go ahead and translate because uh, Isabel hit it to me on the, on the head, talking about how um, how there is so many constraints to allowing the kid to be comfortable and just play, not necessarily at the level of the kid in Europe or in the US that have three or four pairs of, pairs of shoes waiting. But as she mentioned and other people have done, you need to collect shoes. And this is just an instance. You need to collect shoes to allow some of these kids to hold on to something they will use for a year when you come from abroad, do a camp, if you don't have sponsorship from a Nike per se. So yes, she says, and I echo that in some ways, maybe it's a, it's a, it's a matter of perspective that it is a luxury in a way, because when I played, I'm giving my example, I played with all of those stuff she said, the, the no shoes, the, um, the shoes that are, that, are, that are torn and you have to put uh, cardboard inside, because my parents couldn't afford it. And it was fine by me. I had the passion and I was doing it, but she insisted that it's, um, it is a luxury sports and um, because of all those factors and uh, a parent that is having a hard time to afford a meal, that's not gonna be the top of his priority. And it's just natural. You gotta feed your kids before you put shoes on them already to go to school before you try to go on the basketball court. And uh, to me, I'm just wrapping it up a little bit in the sense that 
all those stuff that we're waiting for to come for our kids to be able to play, the COVID situation, as Joe said, the equalizer have shown us that we can do these things. Why don't we have this industry in our country, in our continent, where most of the material Konya comes from, for our kids to be able to play without having to worry about the next brand that's going to come out? The quality. We have the know-how. We have the people. That's just what I wanted to lead on. But she, she, to me, it is a luxury uh, to some level. So we need to raise our standard. That's what I wanted to conclude with because we can play basketball all we want, have the potential, human uh, potential, but we need to raise our standard because we've seen better and we want our kids to have better so they can compete on an equalized uh, playing field when they do play internationally or go abroad. Lindsay. Thanks. Um, I, you know, I, I've been listening here and kind of nodding along and kind of internalizing, trying to kind of wrap some of this together. And I guess I have more of a, a comment and then question um, to uh, the, the panel in that, how do you strike this balance, right? It, so it sounds like th there, there needs to be greater communication um, in and around basketball, that communication to government, that it's necessary to invest in sport and the resources in order to be a, a, a use it as a tool for development for education and all sorts of things uh, to communicate more to, to sponsors that this is something that's worth investing in to communicate to um, to parents that this is a uh, basketball can be a tool for education um, and into greater economic development through obtaining a degree in your education um, and the different uh, traits um, and, and things you learn in and around the game, but also um, basketball as a kind of a, a communication tool to the outside world, right? Um, you, we have examples now of the NBA in Africa, Basketball Africa League, which has a lot of promise and opportunities associated with it, trying to marry some of these um, cleavages that you, you have all touched on, um, but also how, how is basketball communicating amongst different parts of um, Africa about uh, Africa today and also how you see that as basketball as an ability to communicate to the rest of the world. Whether it's through the prism of is this a luxury sport versus a, or more on the track of an economic versus educational endeavor. How do you, how do you, how do you, how can you also use communication to help bridge some of these gaps? I'm going to take a stab at it again, uh, since that uh, seems to be uh, the elder statement <laughs> here. Uh, Lindsay, you really touched upon a, a myriad of things that are quite relevant to the discussion. Uh, communication, there is a lack of communication. There is too much regionalism in, in, um, in Africa versus Africa as a whole. Um, what I'm thinking today, we should think globally within Africa. I should be able, I should be concerned about what's happening in CAR, Luanda, Brazzaville, Kinshasa, Maputo. I need to be aware of what's going on there because if the coaches, for instance, just since we're talking about basketball, are talking to one another, they'll be able to exchange ideas and learn from one another. And who's going to benefit? The players. You'll have tremendous championship because you know, everybody will know what the other team is doing. Then strategy comes into play. That is so critical. Communication is, is what lacking. Everybody is trying to uh, protect his own little small village instead of worrying about the global village as a whole. Because today, uh, we have potential. I'm not going to mention the name, but you, you know who he is. He works for Toronto. I was having uh, lunch with him in, in Senegal. I was with Amadou. And he said to me, he said, Joe, how come we can't find 50 Joel Embiid in Africa? I said, well, because we're too selfish. Everybody will have a Joel Embiid that keep it for them, or they'll you know, nurture it in their own little corner until at the dawn of, I mean, in the middle of the night, they'll just ship them very slowly into Europe. That's what we need to stop. We need to be an open, um, book where people exchange ideas and learn from one another. So communication is definitely the key to um, 
uh, to this? To, to uh, well, I wanna jump in <laughs> to sure. complement what Joe just mentioned in response to uh, Lindsay's uh, uh, query. Uh, communication is important as, let's say in regard this panel, for example, me, uh, I knew of Joe Lopez through someone who played against him and a, friend, a couple of friends of mine in Senegal who have seen him play, but I've never had a video of Joe Lopez. I've seen uh, us two and I've seen uh, Isabel, I've seen uh, Bonnie, uh, I've seen Amchetu play because, okay, I was able to go to an archive to go to YouTube when I worked at FIBA, I was able to watch them uh, competing. But many people in most of the little town, the little cities and villages in Africa do not have access to the medium, to the media, let's say uh, a video, TV broadcasting. In my time, we had some magazine, we have uh, uh, some magazine we were able to, uh, to see. And then slowly, once in a while, someone would bring in a video cassette, so you're able to know the players. You're able to know the, the Joe Lopez and other, all of the other big names that uh, Joe mentioned earlier, who populates uh, most of the country in, in Africa, who have a great tradition in all sports and especially uh, uh, basketball. But being able to have the guarantee that we are able to collect that archive, statistics, videos, uh, games of, let's say, the 1960s, the 1970s, the 1980s, and be able to preserve that library of knowledge, of uh, visual knowledge, of written knowledge, and then have the platform technically to be able to uh, protect it and share it among the global community in Africa, that would be ideal. That was one of the missions we had in um, when I worked at FIBA. This is one of the mission, mission that with people such as uh, Amadou Fall and the NBA uh, was written down to be able to slowly build and grow. But all this is going to be possible if you know that in each of the 54 countries in Africa, government is gonna be, um, is gonna be using better judgment and then a reliable, trustworthy, uh, responsible, uh, uh, operation so that countries are going to be able to make their transition from one administration to the next so that every infrastructure and structure is going to be able to transition smoothly from generation to generation. Right now, it's very, very uh, uh, urgent for most of those countries to be called upon to, to practice good governance. It leads us to what Boniface also, proper management, proper management at the, the government level, which is going to lead to proper management at the federation and, and sports structure uh, level. So communication is key. The thing is we need to guarantee the protection of all of the assets, all of the means, and the way things are uh, uh, being handled in all of the countries. I don't know, Lindsay, if that answers your questions. No, it, it has, and both of you definitely um, have, you know, helped to feed into this. Um, and I guess, you know, one thing that keeps coming back to me is that it, seemingly basketball's close association with education, right? The fact that uh, for a long time, um, the, the, in order to play basketball, um, it, you couldn't really play basketball at a professional level. You had to play through the universities, through the schools, or go overseas to play in universities and you know finish your education. And so, it, it, and this is something that's come up with uh, some of my research and speaking with some of you. Uh, this close association with basketball uh, and education um, has perhaps given it a certain sort of um, I don't know weight uh, that perhaps might be better heard or, or listened to by opinion makers or elites, possibly. I don't know, that's perhaps a, a question to, I don't know, not maybe not necessarily think through and discuss, but something that's just kind of, st st um, it sticks out in my mind, especially when I hear, and I, I know you can't compare basketball to football because it's apples and oranges, uh, but you know the sometimes the derision with which I hear football spoken about um, across many different cultures, um, especially vis-a-vis -vis women and girls, it seems like basketball has not 
obviously it's much smaller, has not been a commercial endeavor, uh, but it seems like basketball it has, does not have that weight or that, that taint with it. Therefore, possibly, could it be a, a mechanism through this communication? I don't know. Uh, I'm going to jump in, uh, Lindsay, if you allowed me. Uh, you know, a couple of years ago, in the camp I organized, I, I usually open my camp, you know, with some discussion about different topics. And, and one year was the importance of education, right? So, and in me, I was always like you said, you know, basketball and studies kind of go together, right? Of course, today as a coach, as an ex-player, I can tell you basketball is a lot more, uh, let's say, tactic than, than football, right? So we play a lot more system. So basically, you have to be smart to play basketball. Exactly. So where do you get smart? In school, okay? So my goal was to try to explain to parents, uh, like Joe said, you know, uh, zero point, maybe zero one percent, you know, will make it maybe professionally. So the goal was never to be, let's say, to play an NBA or to play at a high level. And, you know, I, I trained a younger team, 14 years old in Spain. And a lot of parents were asking me, do you think my kid can be professional? I, I tell them, look, I think there is a realistic goal, you know, that you can have with your son, maybe to motivate him and say, hey, look, if you have a decent level, maybe you can get a scholarship. Maybe you can go to the United States and you can play college basketball, right? So you're doing the things you love, but you're studying at the same time. So anyway, long story short, you know, in this uh, panel I had in my little town, Ponsaren, so one teacher stood up. A school teacher in our small town and said, you know, just to, to empower Boniface, he's saying, I'm going to give you two examples. In this town, we have two people that made it professional. So it was me and was uh, uh, by He played now in, uh, I think, Sweden, football, you know, soccer. And he said, the only two people that made it in this town professionally went to the university. I swear I didn't know, okay? Biran was studying at uh, university. He played in the Duke Dakar University Club, the same team I played, and he made it professional. So he said, if you have doubt that sport and education goes together, this is the perfect example. The only two people that made it in the 6,000 uh, people town went to the university. So every parent should push their kids to play sport, but to study at the same time. In regards to the weight of, uh, of soccer, of football, as compared to other sports such as basketball, yes, of course, uh, football is a lot more popular. It's easier to play. Or it's very easy to set up the goals, you know, on a piece of, uh, on a lot of uh, land or a piece of, uh, but by the beach, etc. You know, it's very easy. You get a ball. If you do not have the regulation ball, you would get a little piece of cloth, you know, bundle it up together, and people are to, able to play uh, 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 football or uh, soccer. Uh, to me, the key thing is uh, uh, also, in addition to what uh, Boniface just uh, mentioned, when I worked at FIBA, our Secretary General was Mr. Borislav Stankovic. And uh, when you would have the central board meeting or the different commissions meeting, everyone would have very good ideas on what to do to promote the sport. And at the same time, as in the uh, uh, NBA and FIBA program, Basketball Without Borders, to combine education together with sports, Mr. Stankovic would always say at the end of the discussion, these are all great ideas, but who's gonna pay for it? Mm -hmm. And every time he says this, all of a sudden you see the room just go silent. Who's gonna pay for it? And what does the regulation say? Most of those who would try to bring ideas expected FIBA to pay and finance everything. The thing is, in each of those countries, they're all sovereign countries. They should be able to know the regulation, fulfill regulation, and if you invest in those countries, as uh, okay, most of the, the guys on the panel mentioned, you need to know that if there are resources who are gonna to go to such and such country or such and such federation, you know it's going to be managed properly. You know that if there is any issue legally, it can be enforced. But in most of the countries, this is, this is not the case. So one of the key things is for the global community in each of the continent by the uh, regions in um, uh, the zones in Africa also to work among themselves so that countries are run properly, government is going to, uh, how should I say, 
to, uh, to implement proper governance, which is the basic principles of uh, proper management. And then the federation and the sports structure within those systems are going to be able to accomplish what they should be accomplishing. A panel such as uh, uh, the Sport Africa Live is going to offer that because we're seeing through the chat, uh, the chat box, there is a bunch of questions. Yes. And all those questions are very pertinent. And we could have, of course, a, I don't know, a week-long or a month-long discussion. And at the end, we're going to be able to find the solution. But right. the key thing is for each country to be handled and managed properly, be governed properly, responsibly. Sports can add on to the economic fabric of the countries. In football, you see a lot of football players from Africa who are playing abroad, who are playing you know, in the different leagues, but many of them do not feel safe to come back and invest in their own country because they know someone is at one point going to divert the funding that should go to the, to the grassroots program, that should go to the young people, that should go to building infrastructure and uh, uh, basically an economic uh, uh, structure around the sport, they're afraid to go and invest back. And these are the soccer players who make a big portion of what professional uh, athletes do coming from Africa. In basketball, to me, I've been proud to deal with people such as uh, Amadou Fall, Boniface Ndong, uh, Dikembe Mutombo, Serge Ibaka, who at their own little uh, um, initiative they would go like the Kemen Mutumba has done to go and build a hospital in the DRC, in Congo, for example. Sergi Baka has supported orphanage in, uh, in Congo, uh, the Congo Brazzaville. You know, I know what Boniface Ndong has done in, uh, uh, in Senegal. And I also know, you know what some, some players try to go and do. The thing is, you want to know that if you invest 25,000 euros or dollars, this is going to be handled properly and someone is going to see the results in a, the family of a young kid, let's say in Benin, for example, who cannot find shoes, who cannot afford shoes because they have other priorities to go and be able to practice the sport. Okay, can I just say something quickly? I know um, we're running out of time probably, but I would be remiss if I don't bring the girls program into the mix because I know we've, we've been focusing a lot on boys and uh, this ties in with communication. Uh, we need to find a mechanism to better communicate with girls' parents because as we all know in Africa, in Senegal in particular, we have realities where uh, parents sometimes marry off their daughters because it's a way, it's an economic decision they have to make. And the communication has to be very critical in that, that we need to talk to parents about the importance of sports. Everybody has spoken about sports and economic development, which is what we do at sea. Um, you know, for, a, for us to be able to develop this continent, the communication has to be along that sports will help uh, create healthier body. I think Anisha said it, also my said it, healthier mind and, uh, you know, and great bodies, you know? So girls are always left out of the mix, uh, not intentionally, but I think it's, it's culturally, and, I, and I'm trying to move away from that because I, I'm, I'm a president of SEED, but I, do, uh, I have boys, elite, I mean, elite boys and, and elite girls, and I want to make sure that they turn out to be the best possible citizen of this continent. Not, you know, the best possible wives, yes, great husband also for the boys, but I want us to start focusing more on education. If you notice, I have not diverted from the educational piece of my uh, position, like I didn't say how talking about some of the social issues. I think it's important that we, we understand that education is the key to everything because I didn't say could have played in the NBA. He could have, but because of the luck of a draw, he didn't. You know, Boniface could have played longer in the NBA. He didn't. So, you know, you've got to have something to fall back on. What does Anise have and Boniface have? They are college educated. They went to school. What did I have? I became a high level US diplomat because I went to school. And I wasn't too shabby of a basketball player, but I, you know, I, I came from a good 
a stable and strong family background where education was very key to everything we did. So I don't want the girls to be left behind and I want to make sure that they get the same um, affordability in terms of higher education that the boys uh, get. So uh, thank you for that. Um, and if we go back to the title of this, um, it was African Basketball Development, Gender and Migration. So I think with the education point, the um, economic political develop, um, we've, we've really touched a lot on the development side. Um, by uh, We've also done some on the gender side of things, and I think um, there's probably more to do. I, I want to touch on the migration issue. Um, and, and maybe also um, Sean Jacobs had a question about the larger history of basketball. And I think it maybe does, um, at least I know in Senegal, it came through a lot of the schools and things like that. So, um, so there, there is that historical side to building it up there. But I know that in my experience um, in looking at, at uh, basketball in Senegal, where I specifically looked at women's basketball, um, initially in the 90s, it seemed as though more of the players um, on the national team were based locally and they played for Duke and uh, Aspo and um, Jean d'Arc and those other, other players. Um, but now um, most of the players on the national team are playing abroad. Um, and that's on the women's side, they're mostly playing in Europe. Um, on the men's side, um, they're um, going to Europe and the United States. Um, and then you also have the interesting case and we don't have, um, except for our translator, we don't have any Nigerians here where on the Nigerian side, you have um, Nigerian Americans, African Americans of Nigerian descent coming. <laughs> and, and many of the players on the Nigerian national team are, um, are, are based in the United States. Um, Angola presents a different case perhaps because I think they're bringing in players from other parts of the continent. So I'm, I'm curious if we could talk a little bit about migration. And, and one of the questions that Sean had, Sean Jacobs um, had, was um, is this going to especially as african basketball begins to develop um, more um, and you have this grassroots development which is great um, people get the education get scholarships um, is that is is africa just going to be supplying europe and the united states and canada with basketball players or you know it, it, can we reverse that and and uh i'll see uh, mentioned some of the problems of people um, afraid to bring bring back things, but I'm curious, especially since many of you in your own journeys did go abroad, and then some of you have even taken nationalities of other countries. And I know that there's a lot of personal decisions that go into that, um, and which passport you have. There's a lot of power and privilege about different kinds of passports, and so it's a complicated question. Um, and I, I think uh, if you if we could spend some time talking about that, and then and then. We're gonna go until 10, my time, 10 o'clock. So in about uh, 10 minutes or so, we might bring in some voices of some of the other people so they can ask their questions directly. So let's so. talk about migration a little bit and then move on. Um, uh, let's see, um, I'm Shetu and then- Bonifat. I can start. <laughs> oh, Isabel, okay. Alors, uh, je repars en français parce que je, je suis le cas le plus probant de, de cette migration. Euh, béninoise de, de, de naissance moi j'ai dû accepter par exemple la naturalisation française pour pouvoir continuer à progresser je suis arrivée ici à l'âge de 17 ans et euh, même avec de gros potentiels pour devenir une joueuse professionnelle euh, c'était compliqué vu mon niveau à l'époque d'avoir une légitimité sur le marché des étrangères donc personnellement la France m'a fait une offre voilà, d'avoir un passeport et d'être éligible pour l'équipe de France. Et évidemment que je l'ai accepté égoïstement. Après, moi, euh, ce qui a facilité mon choix, c'est que je n'ai pas d'équipe nationale au Bénin. Il faut savoir que le Bénin a connu, euh, j'ai dit à part mes, 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 mes anges que j'adore appeler comme ça l'association des anciennes basketteuses qui a redynamisé le basket au Bénin, il n'y a jamais eu de championnat pendant 30 ans. Et c'est quelque chose... Moi, je jouais au basket, mais c'était du playground. Je m'entraînais en club. Je jouais essentiellement avec des garçons, mais il n'y avait pas de compétition. On n'avait pas vraiment une équipe nationale qui faisait des matchs. On a peut-être fait deux ou trois matchs durant toute ma jeunesse contre le Mali, le Nigeria, le Togo une fois. Mais ça a été un regroupement fait en trois jours pour pouvoir présenter des joueuses, pour représenter l'équipe nationale. Donc, pour moi, le choix, il avait été euh, soit 
j'acceptais euh, la nationalité française et du coup, je devenais française et je porterais le maillot, tout ça. Ou, ou soit je disais non au risque de, de me mettre un peu une balle dans le pied sur le marché après du travail. Donc, la question c'est pas très posée. Je ne sais pas si aujourd'hui j'avais une équipe nationale comme le Mali, comme le Sénégal chez les filles ou le Nigeria, Angola, tout ça. Est-ce que j'aurais fait un autre choix Je ne saurais pas le dire. Mais en tout cas, ce qui est sûr, c'est que quand on est à cette place-là, évidemment que les raisons personnelles prennent le dessus. Et, euh, et tout à l'heure, euh, quand j'avais parlé euh, du, du, du coup du basket au Bénin, il y a Simon qui me demande comment on peut motiver les jeunes à venir jouer. Je sais, je passe du coq à l'âne, hein, mais c'est très simple. Moi, chaque fois que je fais des camps au Bénin, il y a du monde. Tout le monde veut venir. Pourquoi Parce qu'ils reconnaissent quelqu'un qui pratique et ils veulent faire comme toi. Et c'est pour ça que je dis l'exposition médiatique est vraiment nécessaire. Parce que du moment où les gens s'identifient à quelqu'un, ils veulent faire comme la personne. Donc, ça crée de l'engouement, ça crée... Euh, ben, les sponsors viennent de plus en plus. Mais pour ça, il faut exposer. Si les gens, tu rentres, on ne sait pas qui tu es, on ne sait pas ce que tu fais, tu as beau faire des événements, il n'y a, a rien autour. Ça, c'était pour toi, Simon, qui m'avait posé la question tout à l'heure dans le chat. Voilà. <rire> OK. Um, someone want to do a, a quick translation of... Uh, Sorry. Of... No, that's okay. It was beautiful, but I, I'm not able to translate it so quickly. So, um. okay. Uh, Isabel said that it is always good for uh, someone to be known, to be a public figure, so that uh, if you do an event or if uh, young young kids, young girls want to get into basketball, they would have someone who's like a role model for them, like in our case in Benin where she had to decide personally whether to pursue a professional career as a foreigner. So it would be very challenging for her to uh, compete against the uh, basketball players uh, in women basketball coming from the US, from uh, let's say Eastern Europe, for example, and her coming from Benin. So it was not easy. And then in Benin also, there was no national team for her to be able to compete at the international level. So she had to make that choice. Yes, it was personal to be able to compete on the professional market and to have a job as a basketball player. But also, it was a decision she has to make thinking, well, maybe I shouldn't have become a French, which gave me the, uh, the chance, the opportunity. But there was no, let's say, basically during 30 years, there was no national team events organization in, uh, in Benin. So she had to make that choice. It's important for her to be known because when she goes back to Benin, she's able to organize events and then people recognize her. A bunch of people are going to participate and also there's going to be some uh, companies and uh, sponsors who are going to be able to, uh, who are going to be willing to associate with Isabel because she's a known figure. But this is not always the case. So, you know, it's important for uh, for people to be aware of this and that was in response to a question that was asked to her by Simone on the uh, in the chat box. Mm -hmm. Um Amshatu, do you um can you speak to the migration question? Yes. I thank you. I I want to touch different part of it in the sense that as I mentioned in the back that uh, the fact to have BAL seriously I think is huge in the sense that it will help in some of the migration part. Because I've seen, as Isa mentioned in, um, in, her, in her comments, is that when you go and you yourself, Mata, you mentioned that the passport part is something that's very impactful in our uh, lives, not only as a basketball player, but just traveling from one country to the other. If you have an African passport, getting a visa is called kind of headache, you know? So it motivates people once you get out there, whether you can play later or not, your goal is to get that passport. But unfortunately, not everybody gets a passport. So what I see is that a high level, I would say honestly, 90 and 95% of those athletes will tell themselves, we, for the most part, we leave, why do we leave Africa? It's because we don't have uh, what's needed for us to get to that high level, unfortunately. We don't have the structure, we don't have the infrastructure, we don't have uh, the required means for us to uh, be as successful as we need to, unfortunately. We've had, like Joe mentioned before, we have great players in Africa. 
many who have paved the way for all of us that could have been so much more than what they've done now, but you, you, we don't even know about them. So that's like so much in that, in that topic that if we talk about it, it's going to take all day, I would say. But to me, once we have better organization, because like I said, for instance, when I go home and I do my camps, I used to do the camps before to be just, uh, anybody can participate in the camp. But to put a big focus on education, I started now, for you to participate in the camps, we go to the schools, we get the grades. You have to have a certain grades to participate in the camps. Because again, to me, not everyone is going to make it to that high level. And we want to make them citizens of the world in the sense that great parents, great ethics and all that, if they don't get, become professional athletes, they have something to fall back on. And that's where I always go back to the fact that my goal is, again, as Joe mentioned, having that cohesion within Africa, but each uh, in Africa, the schools are, it's for the most part, there's private, but unfortunately there's not much studying being done in many of the countries, you know. But if the sports department and, um, what's the name? Sports department and education department can work together, that would make such a big impact because as a young age, you already know, I cannot go to, uh, to basketball. I cannot play to this level if I don't study. Because whether you make it as a basketball player, you will have something to fall back on. So those two is something that those two entities need to talk together to help on the migration side. And there's some athletes that we have, unfortunately cannot migrate either because as we've seen in, for the most part, if you go to US, you can't go if you don't go to school. So you don't even have the opportunity. So that door is already closed. And if you look on the passport sites, if they get there, they cannot get, travel back. So we lost on those, uh, we lose all those uh, talents because of that. So the migration to me, like it's so complicated to me that the countries within themselves and the Federation have to step up also. Because the Federation, if they are involved and Africa as a whole needs to talk together have a specific plan. So we kind of know who's out. How do we help them? Because once you're out, hopefully everybody makes it, but we have a lot that are just left out in the, in the dark, or I don't know how to call it, but I think it's something that needs to be more organized and better communication in that. Um, yeah. Thank you, Boniface. You're, you're muted still. Yes, okay. Uh, yeah, my answer is going to be completely different. You know, I think migration is a great thing. Migration is an achieve, achievement. I think uh, sport is maybe the most fair thing that exists today. It's the one that rewards the best. So us having uh, players going to the NBA is a great thing. That means they've achieved great things. And if you look, all the big national teams, Spain, France, today, the majority of their players are playing abroad. Every team I played in Europe, had the majority that are not nationals, except maybe in the US. So we shouldn't be afraid of, of migration. I think migration should be almost an achievement. Now, what we have to do is to continue to empower our, our leagues, our, our federation, so they can produce a high level of, of competition. That's no doubt. And to, to answer a little bit about what Jakubu said, uh, uh, her story kind of made me sad because uh, a lot of our talent was stolen that way, right? Because of the, the pressure of having a passport. And I had that pressure, you know, I think most of people know, if you look at my biography, it said I'm German and I'm not German. I never had a German passport, you know, okay. My team find a way to make me play as European because my wife is European, but I never took a German passport. And I was threatened, you know, when I started, or oh, if you don't get the passport, you're never going to get to high level. You never, I didn't and I made it. So we have to fight against that to correct that. But we have to ask our federation to do the job and ask to study the job like that to detect our young players that are abroad and try to recruit them and make them play on nationality before they are stolen. Okay, so it's a good thing. Migration is a good thing because sport is global. Every higher league, every best league will try to get the best talent around the world. So I don't think it's bad. What I said? I wanted to uh, mention my first, one of the first cases I got when I got to uh, to Munich uh, working at FIBA was the case of uh, three young uh, kids from uh, Cameroon who were in Russia. 
and they could not come back. Oh, you're muted. You're muted. Oh, somehow it muted you again. <laughs> sorry, sorry. Uh, I wanted to uh, take on what uh, Boniface just mentioned. Migration is a good thing, of course, because uh, playing, playing professional means you have a talent and you are able to become a professional and make a living doing what you're talented at. If you're very talented in IT, uh, for example, you're going to get a contract with either Microsoft or Google or one of those big uh, IT companies. One of the first cases I got when I started working at, uh, uh, at FIBA, when I arrived in Munich, the first case was uh, three young kids, 16, 17, 18, uh, kids from Cameroon who were held up in uh, Russia because someone promised their parents they were gonna become professional, they were gonna start earning money, and they're gonna take them to Russia. When they arrived to Russia, they did not have the label because the teams had not seen them before through a video or whatever, you know. So the kids all of a sudden arrived to Russia, the person who took them to Russia took their passports away, so they were left on their own uh, in a bus station, I think I, uh, I recall, and all of a sudden, there was someone who called, who sent uh, an email to FIBA and say, we have those three kids here, three young kids, minors from Cameroon. They do not have their passport. They say a so-called agent took them to Russia. But when they were tested, you know, their level was not up to uh, what was needed. And they were left alone, abandoned, basically, in a, in a train station. So that was one of the cases in regard to migration. So FIBA had to work together with the, the governing body of uh, Russia and the sports ministry of Russia to have those kids go back to their own country. So you would see a lot of kids and their family being approached in their countries because the kids are either very tall, very athletic, or they show potential, and they're going to receive an offer. And some of those offers are going to be credible. Some of them are going to be legitimate. Many of them are not. It's just someone who's trying to take advantage of the passion those kids have to, uh, to play the sport they love, which is basketball, and then the opportunity to make some money to help their family and support their family through becoming professionals. There is a lot of different things that can be mentioned. But one of the key things is maybe for the families to be informed properly through their federation and their local uh, uh, sports structure that you cannot believe everyone that's going to come to you and say you're going to become a millionaire going to let's say a league in italy in spain or in uh, or in france or going to the us the federation has to be able to have uh, professional structures reliable and uh, legally protected structures so that they can protect their players they should have their database clear so that we know which player came into the sport of basketball in each of the countries at uh, mini basketball level at U U12, U14, U16, U18. And then when they migrate, you are able to follow where those players are going to be. If we have opportunities in the countries for kids to make, uh, for basketball players, be they women or, uh, or men, to make a living playing basketball, they would stay and the sport would grow. This is what is done in many of, uh, in a few countries in Africa, such as Angola, uh, for example. Angola, Egypt, Morocco are the few countries in Africa who are, that are able to sign foreign players and sign American players, uh, players from the Balkan countries, for example. Opportunities to play professional sport and make a living doing your sport. The migration is basically uh, uh, motivated by people trying to make a living because locally it's very hard to work into something else uh, um, and if you, if you have a talent that, that you want to, to, to bargain and, and, uh, and, uh, and how should I say it, and to market that talent, you need to have an opportunity to play sports professionally. That's the reason why you see a lot of migration. People just trying to make a living playing that sport. And then it has to be regulated, it needs to be protected, but in each of the countries, the, the structure has to be, you know, well-structured, well-managed, and uh, protected legally. I'd like to migration, add... Migration, of course, sorry, Joe. Migration, of course, is, as Boniface say, it's a positive thing. If you're someone who's in IT in, in Central African Republic or Senegal 
and all of a sudden, let's say Bill Gates called you up, that's because you have that talent. We have some people such as Serge Ibaka, for example, who did not really finish school, but because of his attitudes, his work ethic and his talent, now he became an NBA champion for uh, the Toronto Raptors, uh, you know, coming from Congo Brazzaville. If I may add to this discussion about migration, I think migration is a great thing. Most of us are the product of migration. But what Anise Ebonifaz mentioned, I'm going to touch upon that. Uh, the reason why we have problem in migration is the failure of the federations of planning, their lack of planning, their lack of uh, ownership, their lack of governance. Because when you have, when you run federation, and this is across this continent, you got to have uh, safeguards where you protect your players when they go overseas, when you need them. Uh, you got to have a database also, you know, who's who, who who's, who's where, where are they? Do you have, I know in Senegal, for instance, we have a plethora of players in Spain. We don't know how they got there, but they're there. You know, what are we doing to keep a database and to keep track of those people? You know, and, and I know the, uh, the Federation now is, is coming finally, um, you know, in tune with that because there's a lot of amount of money that can be made by, you know, following your players and, and they know where they play, where they end up playing professionally because if a, a club team trains you at a certain level and you end up in, in France or in the United States, I'm sorry, in, in Spain, that Spanish team should be able to pay you some kind of rights. Uh, if I'm speaking out of line, you just maybe one fast uh, and uh, Anissa can tell me. But because we don't negotiate those things from the get-go, these kids go and sign professional contract and their federation gains zero. You know, where other countries, you know, when you hear uh, a, a soccer player costs X amount of money because they're paying some team or some club team that trained that kid before they got to the level that they got to. So I'm going to stop here. And I saw uh, Anissa raise his finger. Maybe um, he has some comments. Yeah, but Lindsay also had a comment too. So maybe Lindsay and then Anna said, and we probably won't have time for other questions right now, but um, well, so Lindsay, Anna said, and yeah. yeah. Yep. So I just wanted to quickly chime in here. I think th there's a lot of positives. There's some minuses about migration, but one thing that hasn't been touched upon is that um, through migration, through basketball, um, that is how a lot of different people, um, especially in the United States, but also in Europe, um, that's how people are learning more about Africa, um, about the cultures that um, African teammates come from, um, and especially uh, in a very personal way, right? These people-to-people -people cultural exchanges that are occurring on the court, in the locker room, in the classroom. Um, this is oftentimes many people's first direct uh, introduction to anything pertaining to Africa. And I think one of the important things about ba African basketball migration is that it can help to communicate to other parts of the world about what Africa is like today. And obviously different parts of Africa are you know, di differently um, situated, but uh, it can help to turn the narrative a little bit. I think a lot of people, especially here in the United States, have perhaps more of an outdated um, idea about what Africa is or what it's about or who Africans are like or any of this. Um, and I think through basketball, a lot of that it can be um, um, destructured, right? Can be reset um, to a more uh, realistic understanding um, about what Africa is today. And I know just from a lot of personal anecdotes that ever since Basketball Africa League was lot, um, announced uh, just over a year ago, I've had a lot of Americans say, oh yeah, really? Well, that's interesting that the NBA is investing so much in Africa there must be something there that I you know, don't know about and people have been learning a little bit more. And so I think through migration, um, I think it's a really good conversation starter and can help to communicate and represent a little bit more about what Africa or different parts of Africa are about today. So very, very, I'll get uh, off my soapbox. Very, very good point, uh, Lindsay. Most people, uh, when we arrive in the U.S., for example, in Joe's case, I'm sure in my case, people such as Akimola Juan, Dikembe Mutombo, 
Pascal Siakam, uh, Joel Embiid, Serge Ibaka, etc. It gives the opportunity uh, uh, to many people, to most people outside of uh, Africa, to know of Africa through those athletes. This is what I mentioned, and I like to mention that sport is very important because you would not hear much about, let's say, Kenya, except because of the safaris, and Ethiopia, if you weren't for their athletes. You know, so in the case of, uh, of uh, basketball, all those people are named, you know, especially the, uh, uh, the trailblazers such as Ekim uh, uh, one and Dikeme Mutombo. It gives people a chance to know of their origins of the continent and their individual countries. And this is something that, you know, we have to uh, applaud what the NBA does through the association with FIBA in the Basketball Without Borders uh, program and through the coverage of of those uh, basketball players that have become uh, notorious uh, personalities and they're able to speak up and have people discover a little bit more about uh, uh, the continent and the individual countries. And it gave people a chance to basically mentally, uh, uh, psychologically travel to Congo, to Senegal, to Morocco, to Angola, or to Cameroon through those uh, sports figures. So that's why, as Boniface said, you know, uh, migration is good. It gives people opportunity to, to travel and make a living. And through that making a living, you earn your money and you're able to go back and invest locally, either by just setting up a little bakery for your mom or uh, you support your little, your father truck, truck uh, uh, company, or you start investing in, let's say, a hotel or whatever locally in your country. And then have people be interested in your country and they're going to say, wow, well, Joel Embiid is in the NBA. Akim Olajuwon at Dikembe is building a hospital. Well, let's say we could go and, uh, and invest in that. You know, let's look more into it, you know. So to me, the migration is uh, positive, but it has to be regulated. And uh, the federation and each country through the government has to practice proper management and proper governance. So um, we're actually at the 10 o'clock hour now, and uh, the conversation has gone back to development again through migration, and I think um, that's probably well said. Um, I know that there's a lot more to say, and this I, I don't want to, to end because I think we could go on and talking, but I think um, because we said we would end at 10 and we want to respect everybody's time. What I do want to announce is that on July 11th, we are going to be doing um, this again, but the focus will be on athletics. Um, so uh, Michelle Sykes will be the moderator for that. Um, so I hope that everybody returns again for that. I think with this conversation, um, the, the chat, there's so many rich comments in the chat and I want, we, we were hoping to bring people in, but there was just so much to say that um, we obviously could have gone on for a couple hours here with this. So I know that this is going to be, the recording um, is going to be posted onto Facebook and there is an effort to, um, for uh, the Sports Africa community, we're going to be taking this and coming up with some kind of um, publication, maybe not in the academic sense, maybe in the academic sense, we will be coming up with something um, to this, uh, um, to um, reflect what we've learned here. Um, I do also think that um, we'll probably need to have more discussions like this. And I think, uh, you know, really um, document the histories, document the, the contemporary activities to really push ourselves to, to live up to, to um, uh, see what, what is happening and to make sure that we can see the reality of providing for the grassroots, providing the role models, developing those leagues. Um, and I know that through the, the Seed Academy, through the NBA Africa, through the foundation works, through the summer camps, that, every, that people are involved in um, all of that stuff. I hope that we can stay connected and continue to um, uh, communicate all of this to, um, to the world, but also within Africa. And I think that was, that's one of the clear things that came out of this is to really to make sure that people within the continent know what's going on. So um, I don't know, are, I, it's 10.03. Um, is, is there any one last sentence that anybody wants to say as to you've been like chomping there so just two, uh, 10 seconds I just want to ask the panelists and their circle to not stop in their country I hear a lot of I did camp in my country I did this 
please go across the continent because as you said, we the African, when we go outside Africa, we are the African, we are the expert. Get across the continent and let's cross check each other because I was happily surprised to do events in Malawi and in Waga to see how we can connect directly as African as much as it is in Senegal. So please don't stay in your country. Thank you. Okay. This is a All very right. good point to me. I would like for, uh, of course, Joe would be as the younger statement uh, of the group to the, the final word, but to uh, take on what Astu mentioned, to me, I was lucky because of maybe my frame of mind and uh, the, the, my perspective on uh, life. I've done camps in Cape Verde, in Senegal, in the Ivory Coast, in Cameroon, in Chad, in Sudan, in Congo, etc. So this is us too. That's what needs to be done. And that's what we should all endeavor to, uh, to pursue. And especially call upon our governing bodies to proper, prop good management, to, uh, to, um, to implement proper governance so that people are gonna trust the structures in Africa. Most of the problem have, uh, most of the problem people have with the African uh, uh, young talent is sometimes the doubt their age. So this also has to do with the legal framework and the integrity of uh, our structures in Africa. All right, um, uh, Isabel, do you have a last word of français anglais? <laughs> oh, just uh, want to ask my big brothers and sisters, like uh, our generation are waiting, you know. We don't know how to step and what to do. So if you have any idea, just grab us and then we're gonna follow you. We have energy, we wanna change things. We just don't know where to start. So waiting for you guys to lead us, to show us the way, and then we're gonna put all the, our energy in. So, and thank you for having me with you guys all. All right. Okay, with that, I wanna really thank the panelists for coming together at this time and giving us um, uh, you know, a lot of yourselves, your stories, um, your thoughts, and uh, thank you to all the participants on Facebook and on Zoom who um, brought so many good. We have people from Pakistan, we have people from all over Africa, from Europe, um, so wonderful that you are, you are with us here today. So with this, I'm going to, to end this uh, part of it, and we will see you again on July 11th um, for athletics. Okay, take care everybody and be safe.